about ourselves. Uh, Christian Men Ministry, ministry is an interdenominational men ministry whose vision is to disciple men using biblical truths uh, and principle. One of our goals is to create a network of men who can coach and mentor each other to fulfilling our mandate as priests in our home, uh, in, in our households, and godly leaders and servants in our churches and workplace. Uh, we discuss our experiences within our homes and the marketplace and, and use unchanging truths from the Bible to challenge and hold each other accountable. And, uh, and, and, we, and we're grateful that you, you continue to support us and, and to be part of the ministry to learn and grow. Uh, I'm sure the, to, to be the, we've got uh, other numbers which will be posted on the group. Should you want to, for prayer requests and for, for any other challenges as you, as you are aware of where the country is at, that you will be able to, to reach for comfort and for support. Uh, but today we, we've got an amazing speaker. And before I get to that, I would just like us to, to pray, to open in prayer, and, uh, and, and uh, then I'll introduce the speaker. Let's close our eyes. Father God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you're still on the throne. Thank you that we can rely on you. Thank you that you, you continue to lead us the correct way. Uh, and as a, even though our country is under chaos, you are still in the, in the throne. And we can trust that things will be better. We can trust that you will, you will make them better. You will, you will lead us through this difficult time. Father God, I pray for the, for the speaker. Uh, Mike Ono, who's going to be sharing with us, that as he shares, men can have receptive arts and open and be open and be teachable so that we, we change our minds and to be better, to be better leaders of tomorrow. We're grateful of Mike and his family. We're grateful that he's taken time to be able to come and share with us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to be, as I, as I introduce our speaker, uh, the, the topic today is corporate leadership. Uh, uh, Mike is a corporate leader uh, who, is, uh, who has acquired leadership experience through working with organizations across Europe, South Africa, uh, I mean, South America, Middle East, Asia, Africa, and the U.S. Mike leadership experience spans across anglophone speaking country fr francophone uh, which are this fr french speaking countries portuguese speaking countries uh, mike's leadership exper experience experience uh, spans across many industries such as consultancy life insurance general insurance health insurance asset management retail fmcg telecoms uh, fintechs, and many other. Mike is a corporate leader who has worked in various uh, capacities such as non-executive director, Sunlam Life Senegal, which is current role, executive responsibility for innovation and growth influencing 34 countries in Africa at, Sun, at Sunlam, Pan-African, which is also current role. CEO of uh, Liberty Emerging Consumer Market, uh, FD at uh, Liberty Emerging Market, Emerging Market Consumer Market, uh, CEO Alight Life. Mike has worked in, uh, in numerous other role, leadership roles. In his current, uh, current role as an executive, uh, innovation and growth, Mike works with over 30 CEOs across uh, African continents, over 250, 250 executives across the African country, countries. Mike has also worked as with CEO and directors, executives and leaders on numerous international and multinational local organizations across all continents. Uh, at 45 years of age now, Mike will be sharing some, some of the insights he has gained on corporate leadership. Mike holds a, business, a master's in business administration degree. Uh, aside corporate leadership, Mike also has extensive experience in ministry leadership, philanthropic uh, leadership, social leadership, and author leadership. Lastly, 
Mike's leadership experience spans across political, governmental, uh, labor movement, having worked with leaders across national government, ministry, defense, police, health, education, transport, local government, mayors, provincial government, MECs, premiers, political parties, and trade unions, and other civic organizations. I cannot wait to, to get Mike to, to start sharing with us. And thank you again, Mike, for, for with all of the things that you do, for having the time to can still continue to come and share with us so that we can learn from you, we can grow, we can be better individuals that can lead the country. Mike, over to you. All right, good morning, uh, Herman, and good morning to everybody. Good uh, morning, Mike. Right, let me just switch on my study lights. I think I'm appearing very dark. I don't know if that would help. Just yes, that is that is spot on, Mike. Now I know who has helped my MEC <laughs> to make sure that I can get vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, thank you uh, to everybody you know, who is uh, on the call. And I also just want to say thank you uh, to Sam, you know, Sitole, a friend and a brother of mine, you know, who asked me to come and, uh, you know, just share some things, you know, with you guys. Uh, I was here previously and it was quite, um, you know, an exciting time just to fellowship with, uh, you know, all of you. So I'm looking forward to be you know, engaging uh, with you this morning. Um, my understanding of how the session is going to run is that it's a Q&A session. So I understand Brother Felix, you know, is going to be moderating. <laughs> so Felix and I did not, um, you know, meet to prepare, you know, because what I say to him is these sort of sessions work better you know if they are being led by the holy spirit so instead of uh, preparing i would prefer to just get uh, you know the questions to come along so he gladly you know um accepted to moderating the the session in that way so i'm looking forward to to sharing i think what i'll just position before uh felix comes on is that I'm still learning, <laughs> you know, about this domain of, um, you know, of leadership. Uh, so I'm looking forward to be learning from you today as I get to hear your questions, you know, where you are at, uh, what are the things that you are grappling with in your organizations? You know, how do you make the leap, you know, from wherever you are? And I'm sure as Felix moderates, uh, that will come, that will come through. You know, for me, I think to just encourage many men, you know, who are on this call, I'm a mathematician, you know, by training. So I studied mathematics and statistics and looking at uh, people who study programs like that, you would not even imagine that your journey, your journey ends up as a leadership journey. So I hope uh, what our minister today, you know, through whatever you guys are going to ask is something that we encourage, you know, all of you. Thank you guys for inviting me. Over to you, Felix. Thank you so much, Mike. Good morning. Wonderful having you um, on the platform. Um, let's let's go straight into it and let's get um, the discussion going. Just before we start, I just want to encourage the men to to to, say, to indicate that this is effectively an open session. So you you are welcome to throw your questions in the chat. Um, we'll be having the discussion with Mike and also be picking the questions that you throw in the chat and and. Um, uh, you can you can start firing questions straight away as as we start um, as we start uh, discussing. Mike, I want to start a bit from your role. You 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 are responsible for innovation and a host of other things in the in the in the Sunland Group. Tell me, how how does let's start from from innovation. How does how does innovation, in your view, impact leadership? How does it touch leadership? Or are those two different things that have no relationship with each other? All right. Um, thank you very much for that question, Felix. You know, before I took up the role uh, of uh, leading innovation, you know, across Africa uh, for Sunlam, you know, I had no clue what <laughs> what innovation was. You know, I thought I knew uh, until I got into my role. 
So I've been leading innovation now for Sunlam over the last um, eight months. And um, what I've gotten to witness there is something that has blown my mind. And I've asked myself, where was I, you know, <laughs> all these years? You know, why did I not go into innovation, you know, from day one, uh, you know, in my career? So linking back to leadership, what I have gotten to learn and I'm still learning is that uh, innovation is actually at the core of a leader's agenda. And it does not matter, you know, what kind of industry you operate in, you know, if you subsegment uh, our economy or society, you know, into government, into non-government, into private sector and many other. What you begin to realize is that one of the problems you face in leadership is what uh, I would describe as stagnation. So for you to be able to move away from a place of stagnation to any kind of progress, whether you're moving vertically or you're moving horizontally or you're moving diagonally, you need some kind of um, innovation. And when you look at the definition of innovation, it actually gives you the essence of why it is important. So innovation, you know, at its core, has got just three, three definitions. One definition of innovation is how do I do things differently? So just by looking at that, you realize that if you want to follow a path where you do things the same way all the time, then you will not grow. So how do you do things differently? Another definition of innovation is how do I do things better? You know, so again, just looking at it as a reflection, if you choose to do things the same way and you don't seek to effect any improvement, there is no value that will be created. And then lastly, when you look at the third definition of um, innovation being, how do I bring in transformation? You know, then you realize that unless there is transformation, you will end up being obsolete because the environment around us is changing. So innovation then becomes the tool and the bridge that takes us from where we are today to adapt to, to the changing environment. And then more importantly, if you are wanting to get ahead, then innovation is your toolkit to get you to get ahead. Thanks, Felix. That's, um, those, are, those are important questions. And, um, and, and as, you, as you indicated um, earlier on, I loved when you, when you gave your introduction, you were indicating that you know, you, you, are, you are a mathematician by, by, by original training, and, yeah. um, but you find yourself as a leader. And I think as, as people, as men, many of the times we find ourselves in that position. Sometimes it's from your training, you, you, you train in some technical role, something you like, and then you're an engineer, you find yourself as a leader. Sometimes it's in relationship. You just love a girl and suddenly you're a father and you're a leader. And you need to lead the family and other people that you don't know and, and, and the like. So so those transitions a lot of the times um, are difficult. My, my question is, in your journey, if you if you created what I would say a philosophy or a, a leadership mantra, do you have a, a, a guiding kind of like principles that, that you put in place when you lead in particular in, in corporates? Yes, Felix. So mine is a, is a very simple one. You know, I'm driven by one word uh, and it's a P word. And that word is uh, purpose. So for me, what I've established is that unless uh, you locate, you know, your purpose, you can't establish your center of gravity, you know, in the domain of leadership and also broadly, you know, in life. So what I pursue uh, pretty much 99% you know, of the time is to continually recalibrate myself around my papers. I spend a lot of time you know, just reflecting around papers. So when I look at leadership for me, it's not uh, the driver, but it is a subset of um, my papers. So how I look at it is to say, I've been given a leadership role you know, to perform but where does it fit, you know, in the context of my purpose? And then as I lead, my ultimate measure at a personal level, you know, is measuring my effectiveness against my purpose. From a corporate perspective, you know, I'm measured uh, on KPI, KPIs and many other measures. But even in the context of those KPIs, what I try to locate for myself is my purpose. So for me, it's leading with purpose and for my leadership to align to my purpose. Okay, great. That's that's, um, that's 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 very helpful and very very clear. And in that context, where you um 
you are leading in a, in a particular purpose or in a particular direction. Let's talk a bit about the, the challenges. What are the general challenges that leaders face? What are the main challenges that leaders face in, a, in, in their day-to-day -day work within that context? All right, so that one is probably one of the most important uh, questions, you know, the questions around, the question around what are the challenges of, uh, of leadership? So I've occupied, um, you know, many different leadership roles in many different organizations. And I work with a lot of leaders, you know, and as I work with them, you also get to see, you know, where, you know, where are their challenges, uh, you know, what are they grappling with? So when I look at, um, you know, a lot of the issues that I've seen around the challenges, I think I would, you know, bucket them in a few buckets with no order of um, order of importance. The one place I would start off is by first of all understanding your mandate. You know, every leadership journey has got a mandate attached to it. So that mandate, whether it's a political mandate, it's a shareholder mandate, uh, whether it's a corporate mandate, it does not matter. You know what the source and the origin of the mandate is, but there is always a mandate. So when you look at uh, the mandate, you know, one of the questions, you know, you grapple with is around, can I deliver, you know, on this mandate? And then as you look at um, your ability to deliver, you know, on that mandate, you do not deliver in isolation as a leader. You know, you need a host of things, you know, to help you with that uh, delivery. So at the first uh, level, you need people, you know, to, to work with. You need people to support you. You need people, you know, to follow you. And navigating the people realm uh, is probably the most complex <laughs> because every single individual is so different, you know, so unique, uh, you know, very different in the way they think, the way they do things. And every single person is also so different in terms of their expectations. So creating the balance, you know, upon which you can uh you know mobilize you know people to align to the mandate you know under which you are being you know managed it's often a challenge but sometimes you can find people that are at variance to the mandate they may also not like you as a person you know how then do you maintain a strength you know in that regard so that's one around people the second challenge is around uh, resources if you are to lead effectively, you know, you need uh, resources and resources are a lot of things. Resources could be money, resources could be equipment and many other things. So what you often find uh, in most organizations is that there is always a constraint around resources. So when you're faced with constraints around resources, how do you navigate, you know, yet you still have a mandate. And then the third thing is around, you know, the tools do you have the tools, you know, within which uh, to deliver, you know, what you have been tasked to deliver? Sometimes you do have uh, a leadership mandate. You have the people behind you, but you actually don't have the tools. How do you navigate? And then the next thing for me would be the support structure and infrastructure. Do you have the support, you know, and where is that support coming from? And is it going to sustain you? And then the last thing I would mention, is something uh, that in the world of finance, they call the agency conflict. So how the agency conflict often manifests is that when you are leading, you sort of um, standing in the nucleus and around the bubble of the nucleus, there are a multitude of stakeholders, each coming from a different perspective. So on one end, if you are in a shareholder owned organization, you have got shareholders on one end. On the other hand, you have got the government, on the other hand, you have got employees. On the other hand, you have got customers. On the other hand, you have got your community. How do you create the balance and still able be able to deliver to your mandate and also satisfy the various uh, stakeholders? So those are some of the challenges that one would encounter. Thank you. Thank you for that data. Very, very detailed indeed. I see we've got a question here from Brother Sam. It's an interesting one. He says, when did, brother mike when did you first know that you are a leader are leaders born or it's something one can learn yeah so i'll start with the second and then <laughs> you know i'll come back to the to the first one so i believe uh it's a it's a combination uh you know of um you know uh, one being you know a leader with 
uh, some natural gifting, you know, towards it. But I, what I also believe is that there is a place uh, for there is a place for one to, you know, to learn about leadership. So if I look at the first one around around the gifting, um, there is a space where you know God gives you some some insights that not everybody you know has you know those kind of insights. There is a space where God gives you some special skills and some special you know talents you know that are required for leadership. So in that instance, you know, one can say I was born with uh, leadership traits, but I do have a view that every person, you know, is a leader. You know, I've got a view that every person is a leader. Um, even when you are in an instance where you think that you do not have any followers following you, you are a follower of self. So your primary responsibility to leadership is leading yourself. So when you premise on the basis of uh, the one, then you actually realize that you as an individual, you have a responsibility to lead yourself. And then in the instance where you get into family or any other types of relationships, you often find that invariably they converge and gravitate towards some form of leadership. So you then find that even where you think, ah, I am not naturally born to be a leader, you are called to become, to become a leader. And then, um, when you then look at leadership as a development, for me, that's where I think that all of us can actually equip ourselves. So even where you have got uh, less confidence and you doubt yourself around leadership, you can equip yourself through uh, developing yourself. You know, there, is, there are a lot of resources, you know, freely available, be it on YouTube, be it on Google, be it, you know, books, you know, even talking to peers and people. So you can learn a lot around, you know, how to lead. So it's a combination of uh, a combination of things. And then for me, uh, as a person, I did not relate to, you know, my uh, youth, you know, in the context of, um, you know, leadership. But when I reflect today and I see the journeys of life that the Lord is, uh, has given me, I begin to realize that uh, it actually came through at a very young age, you know, starting in the home, uh, starting in the community. You know, I grew up in the ghetto, you know, uh, in a place called Mbare, you know, in Zimbabwe. So I used to be very, very naughty, you know, <laughs> leading, you know, little peers into funny little uh, things, you know. So it started at a very young age and then developed into, you know, kindergarten, developed into, you know, early childhood development schooling all the way through primary, secondary, etc. So throughout uh, the various schooling systems, uh, I occupied leadership uh, roles, whether it was in class or at a school level or in various competitions that schools would do against other schools. So it's something that started at an early age, but I didn't realize at the time that it was actually leadership. It's only today when I look at uh, the sort of places that the Lord keeps taking me, I realize, oh, wow, you know, he, he actually started developing me uh, for this for a very long time. Thank you for that, Felix. Great, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Brother Kudzai asks a, a question that is a bit a bit similar, but, but is, is, I think it's important to tackle it separately. He says, Brother Mike, how did you discover your purpose? Or, or how does one discover their purpose? Sure, <laughs> yeah, so I would like to make a pronouncement uh, first and foremost. And then uh, I'll just walk you through, you know, a journey. So what I would encourage first and foremost to everybody is that it is very, very important uh, to locate uh, your purpose. You know, if you are in this meeting today and you do not know your purpose, I would ask you to just take that one thing, you know, to ask yourself, what is uh, your purpose? The reason being that the life that we have has got a measure, you know, at the end of it. So it is very probable that if you do not locate your purpose, you can find yourself accustomed to the doing, 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 doing. But in the end, you realize all you did was out of your purpose, outside your purpose. You never did what, uh, you know, you were meant to do. So it's very important to locate the papers. And then number two, 
um, if you do not locate your papers, for those people that uh, do not locate the, their papers, they often live with a tension, you know, within them, but they can't explain the tension. You know, sometimes it's a tension that says, I feel empty. You know, I've got this big job, you know, but it doesn't satisfy me. I've got all this money, but it doesn't satisfy me. I've got all these materials, but they don't satisfy me. Often the gap to that sort of space is your purpose in that you could be in a place where you are not called, you know, to be. And the tension that you are experiencing is a tension most of the time, if you really locate it, it leads you to your purpose. When you get onto the path of uh, your purpose, you just find yourself entering, you know, some measure and level of peace irrespective of what you experience along along the journey. So for me, I didn't understand, uh, you know, the concept of um, purpose. You know, I just used to think, you know, you can just, you know, do what you want. You know, you can just make calls. You know, I don't like this. Now I do that. I don't like this place. Now I go to that place. So how I discovered purpose was actually uh, not, I didn't discover it as an objective to say, I'm going to discover about purpose. So as I studied the word of God, what I realized was I kept coming across the concept of predestination. And I didn't understand it fully. You know, initially it was in Ephesians 1, 4. And then I started seeing it in many different places. And then I started uh, doing my own research, you know, to understand what exactly is predestination. And it was through that process that I began to discover that we are each born, you know, to a purpose. So I then started, um, you know, researching and locating, you know, my path, my purpose, and I'm thankful that, you know, I was able to find it. So it is something that, you know, you cannot find your purpose in the natural because purpose doesn't come from us. You know, it comes from God. So we have to seek him to guide us into knowing what that purpose is. Great. Thank you for, for that detail. And it's something that, um, that is important for all of us to, to work through and make sure that we, 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 we determine what our purpose is. I want to pick another question from Brother Sam. He says, he, he, he moves it on the social side. And he says, how does marriage and your relationship with your wife affect leadership? How did your wife help you on your leadership journey? All right. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. So to those, I don't know uh, who knows me, who doesn't know me, you know, uh, who is on the call. So uh, my wife went home to be with the Lord. Uh, it's precisely four years uh, next month. So for the last four years, I've just been raising my, uh, my children on my own, you know, navigating through, you know, everything that the Lord is asking me to do, you know, in that setup. So I was married to, you know, to Cleopatra. And for me, she was very instrumental, you know, uh, because she's the one that led me to, you know, to the Lord. So I got to know the Lord through her. I got to become saved uh, through her, you know, back then when we were still uh, still dating. So her role and influence uh, in my life, uh, you know, from a leadership perspective was that it, it goes beyond leadership, you know, it's across uh, all life. But her influence in my life was that uh, she was a very prayerful, you know, person. You know, she was a person uh, established, you know, in the word. So what I discovered, you know, through the process was that as we were um, running our life, our marriage, you know, through, you know, just following God, through following Jesus and in prayer and in getting uh, his support, you know, I would see, you know, doors, uh, doors of leadership, you know, open, you know, in my life. I got to become, I mean, like a, you know, an MD at a very young age, you know, and, you know, if you were to look at my circumstances, my background and everything around me, it was, you know, what I would call an impossible, you know, um, you know, set of doors that got opened. And if I bring my wife, you know, into uh, that framework, what I would attribute to her are many things. First, in the spirit, you know, is intercession. And then secondly, you know, the support. And then thirdly, the, the engagement. What I found, um, you know, in the time that the Lord allowed us was that 
the more time you have uh, to engage, to discuss, the more you share your dreams, you open up your heart, the more you empower you know, your wife or your partner to be able to support you through their prayer, through their emotional support, through their physical support. And uh, a lot of the things that you know, we would take uh, for granted you know, as people, often you know, when a wife is supporting you, it's not that evident. But in my instance, where she has now gone home to be with the Lord for uh, four years next month, you begin to see, you know, the difference. The little things that, you know, she would do uh, to keep me going. In this instance, you know, in my current role, I influence, uh, you know, close to 350, you know, executives around the continent. And most of the time I get drained up, you know, emotionally. And I feel the gap, you know, most of the time, you know, I get low spiritually and I feel the gap. So looking at where I am today and where I used to be, I can actually, you know, calibrate the significance of, uh, you know, a wife, you know, in supporting you, helping you and ensuring that, you know, you can be at the top of your game, you know, as a leader. So I could write a lot of books, <laughs> you know, around that. Uh, Samuel has asked me, you know, to come to the forum one day, you know, to just speak about that journey around, you know, what is the difference, you know, being supported by a wife, and running, you know, as a widower, you know, in my instance, and I shall come and I shall share that in a little bit more detail. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. And um, and yeah, well done. Um, I didn't realize it's four years. You, you have been doing um, good work with the with the with the, with the youngsters. And um, please please keep at it. I want to to move on to two questions. I want to try to combine two questions. Um, Brother Taf asked two questions. I'm going to take one of his questions and combine it with another one from Brother Jones. So, Brother Taft says, you have indicated the importance of people in an organization. How do you balance maintaining diversity without compromising your values? And then the second one that will come from Brother Jones is, there's normally the principal urgent problem in leadership, where one leader ends up pushing his or her own agenda instead of the principal's vision. How, how do you, how have you managed to tackle this in various domains you have led? So both of them are very corporate type of questions. The first one is diversity and balancing that from a Christian angle. And the other one talks about the principal agent challenge in corporate leadership. Over to you. All right, thank you. So I'll pick the first one first. So I'm a big uh, believer of uh, E, D, and I. <laughs> you know, so E, D, and I uh, stands for equity, diversity, and inclusion. So when you are leading, you know, you ought to be all embracing because the role of a leader, you know, goes above self, it goes above race, it goes above culture, it goes above tribes, it goes above nationality, it goes above religion, it goes above many other factors. So when you are in a leadership uh, position, what you need is what you need to do or to reflect on is that you are solving what I would call wearing my statistical hat. You are solving an optimization problem. So invariably, you have got a mandate, you know, that you have to deliver to. And that mandate for you to deliver to that mandate, you are faced with a number of variables. And those variables speak to, you know, the different skills you need the different competencies you need, the different experiences you need. So as you try to look at um, the diversity of those variables, uh, your challenge there is around how do you optimize for delivery? So in optimizing for delivery, the significance of uh, diversity becomes important. So you wanna, di you wanna diversify around skill, you know, because you, you don't solve for the person first, you solve for the output. So you look at uh, your ultimate deliverables and then you sub-segment that into what outputs will get you to deliver you know, on the mandate. And then when you look at the output, what you saw for next is the skill. So once you define the skill set required to support that delivery, the next leg now is how do you define the job? How do you define the roles? And when you define the job and you define the roles, you are doing that without knowing the people. And then lastly, you then need to think about what we call the archetypes. 
what are the different archetypes or characteristics that you need in order you know to to get the delivery to be done and then lastly now you're solving for people so when you are solving for people uh what i think this is a personal view uh it's not empirically uh you know research begged but it's a personal view from my experience you need to strike a balance so when you look at uh, striking a balance there are many things that you need to think about so you need to strike balance from an age profile perspective so you can't have a team that is you know let's say weighted around old people only you know with respect to every elderly person you know we need to build succession planning within the system so you need to you know strike a balance around around age you need to strike a balance around gender you know you can't have a team of males only you know how do you bring gender balance into the equation you need to balance races you know how do you bring different races in and then you also need to balance you know other you know other specifications so when you strike the balance you actually see that diversity manifesting as a glory because you see all these different skill sets coming together you know people thinking differently bringing different perspectives because a leader doesn't have the answers you know a leader you know a leader derives their strength from harnessing you know uh, the resource that is sitting in those that are around them so if you can be able to navigate around that then you get uh, empowered you know to to be able to lead successfully in diversity and then the second question around uh, the urgency problem you know we you've got a principal but now you are finding yourself you know in a conflict a space where you now want to push your own agenda that is contrary to that of the principal this is one of the urgency conflicts that i referred to earlier on when you find yourself uh, becoming at variance you know with your principal if you are not able to repent you know and reconcile then that should trigger you know your exit because the mandate is not your mandate you know if it's a shareholder the mandate is a shareholder mandate if it's another type of principal the mandate is that of the principal so when you are a leader you are employed or appointed into a position to deliver on the mandate of the principal the moment you now want to push your own agenda you are no longer relevant to that to that particular setup so if you can't repent and reconcile then that should trigger your exit okay great great thank you so much i want i want to take one more question from um, brighton um brighton says please can you share some of the battles you faced when you transitioned from a technical role uh, the staff role or actuarial role to leadership role, CEO role, and back again to a more technical, transformative role uh, like innovation. How, how, how was that journey and what, what were the challenges that you faced? All right. So, sure. Brighton, that's, that, that's a powerful, uh, powerful question. So, I qualified um, as an actuary. I didn't study actuarial science at university, so I studied actuarial science. Uh, on my own. So I qualified as an actuary uh, within five years of uh, personal study. And uh, when I was growing up in my training, you know, everything was technical, 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 technical. And then after I qualified, um, you know, it was quite a challenge for me because the expectations on the organization, you know, were now on me, you know, to lead client assignments. I was in a consulting environment so the expectations for me on me were now to lead client assignments so i would only look at client assignments from a technical perspective i would not look at them from a business perspective i would not look at them from a bigger picture perspective so my biggest learning point was around how do you grow into becoming you know a big picture person you know so I was quite happy that hey i'm an actuary you know but actually i couldn't operate as a you know as a leader i couldn't operate in a non-leadership um sorry in a non-technical role so i had to to learn a lot about about um about you know the bigger picture environment in a real context because often you think you know but actually when you're out there it's very different so i invested a lot of time just to learn about markets and at that point i decided to also study uh, a master's in business administration degree, which I then did, and then it helped me a lot 
to think about you know what is the broader domain of um you know of um you know issues and things you know we should consider out there so what i found in doing my mba was that uh you know i did over i think 14 or 15 different courses and all of those had nothing to do with my technical training so that then gave me a framework to then use to say okay if i am to be non-technical i must know about marketing i must know about um customer experience i must know about um, operations i must know about it i must know about the whole lot so i then begin now you know to look for opportunities in the work environment that would give me you know that kind of exposure so you know i think since 2005 i have not operated as an actuary you know i've been operating in non actuarial roles learning more about you know the broader world uh, beyond me and then when I ultimately then started uh, leading, it wasn't easy, you know, initially, because I initially came as an uh, autocrat. And then I quickly experienced quite some, <laughs> you know, important lessons. And then I began to learn about how do you open up, you know, to actually lead more broadly. So I began to apply different leadership styles and experience teaches you because some things go right, some things go wrong. And then when things go wrong, you have to learn from, you know, what didn't go right. And then that then helps you more and more, you know, there. So those are some of the things, Felix, that, you know, that I've learned. And then in my current role, innovation is actually uh, not, um, not technical. So what I have found uh, about innovation is that I deliver, you know, through people. You know, so I as an individual, my job, you know, is to just lead and guide. And then you have uh, people that are specialists in their environment, you know, coming up with all the bright ideas. So your role there is mostly just steering. Uh, I think the skill that you need is to stimulate a curiosity. If you are able to stimulate curiosity, then what you need to do is to say, how do you unlock the embedded creativity that lies within each person? And if you stimulate in the right way, you begin to see that creativity come out, and then that gives you the innovation that 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 you're looking for. Thank you, Felix. Great, great. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I like I like your comment that that innovation is not technical. That's an interesting comment. Yeah. I want to I want to combine two questions because they've they've got some similar relevance. Um, the first one is uh, is is the second question from Brother Taff, which was, what are some of the daily habits? you have adopted to assist in your leadership journey, so your daily habits. But I want to bring you to the question from Brother Sam. He also asks a, a personal angle type of question. He says, what are your best role models on leadership in the Bible and why? Over to you. All right, sure. <laughs> I'm going to start off with, start off with um, you know, the, the habits. So there are many habits that you literally have to you have to develop, you know, uh, if, if you really want to function, you know, in a leadership role. Uh, if your training background and experience has never been in leadership, then you literally, literally have to learn to develop uh, new habits. So for me personally, some of the things that I, I, I've had to go through and I still go through, you know, because it's a continuous learning process. You know, you, you don't get to a place where you say, sure, I got it all, you know, every day you are learning. So one of the things that I do is I read a lot, you know, so I read a lot of books. Uh, I read very broad uh, subjects, things that <laughs> some things you may think I would never read. I read, you know, so I try to continually just read and learn, you know, from others, read and learn from others. So I read a lot of books, number one. Number two, I look for publications uh, that stimulate my thought process. So I like publications from places like the Harvard Business Review. So every day I go through between 10 to 20, you know, different articles that I work through. And then, you know, sometimes, you know, I comment on almost every one of them. Sometimes I do not comment. So I go through articles and then I also follow uh, the economists, you know, so I go on the economist on a daily basis. And then I do a lot of um you know, market research, I'm very curious around markets. So I'm always, I mean, like on markets, checking what's happening in markets, 
you know, and all of that. And then what I also, you know, try and do, you know, here and there is to interact, you know, with people uh, that, uh, you know, you've got a like mind, you know, to mine and to also learn from them. And then in, in all this, uh, there is also the biblical dimension. So in my own world, I spend probably three to four hours a day, you know, in the word of God. So I get a lot of inspiration from there and, you know, the last time I was here, someone was asking me if, you know, if one way to look for the one book that teaches you about leadership, you know, which one is the book, you know, and I mentioned at the meeting that it was the Bible. So those are some of the habits. And then um, as I've been um, navigating, you know, uh, post uh, the transition of my wife over the last, um, you know, four years, so I cook on a daily basis. So I make breakfast. Uh, these days we work from home, you know, so where I can, I make lunch. And then every single night I'm cooking, you know, so I cook lots of different recipes on a daily basis. And then if it's a weekend like today and tomorrow, I go out all the way, you know, so those are some of the things that I do. And then lastly, to just spend time uh, with my three boys. And then now coming to the question that, um, you know, Brother Sam, you know, is asking around, you know, when you look at leadership, from a biblical perspective, you know, who are some of what are who are some of the people that you know I have learned from. So it has been a very interesting journey, you know, because I had not uh, studied Jesus Christ, you know, the manner that I've done uh, in the season that you know I've been on over the last, I think, eight to nine months now. So prior to the deep dive study that I'm doing now, you know, I was attributing you know, Paul, Apostle Paul, you know, is the one with, uh, you know, quite some outstanding leadership, you know, experiences looking at, you know, the various journeys that he had to walk and how he had to respond and to to stay or stay on course. Uh, but what I have been discovering, you know, in this season is that I'm currently working through, uh, you know, every single word that, you know, Jesus Christ, you know, ever said in his three years of ministry. And as I've done a deep immersion, you know, into, uh, you know, every one of those words, I've got into a place where I will just give you an example. I spent, um, you know, eight months, you know, just studying the book of John chapter 14. You know, it only has got 31 verses, but it took me eight months to work through every single one of them to the point of revelation. And as I've gone through that, I've begun to realize just how much, you know, leader, uh, Jesus Christ is deposited to us, you know, as a leader. So for me, I mean, like, he's the number one role model. After him, I would go for Apostle Paul. And then after Apostle Paul, there are a few other leaders that I've seen, but their accounts are not documented sufficiently. So those are the two that I would choose, uh, Felix. That's great. And, um, and I think, I think, Obviously, those are those are great and important uh, characters in the Bible, in the New Testament, and um, they, they give us a very good role model or picture to to follow. I want I want to bring in two questions that are that are current. T -t Talk to us a bit about leadership in the pandemic. The pandemic has changed a lot of things. So, so you you would be flying around Africa now, seeing people in Senegal and, and those places. You are not. How are you leading people in Senegal and across across the world in the in the pandemic? And also touch a bit on digitization. How is digitization impacting um, leadership and the work that you do, and possibly innovation? All right. So, sure. So, just to give some some context, I do on average um, ten meetings a day, and um, I do on average between fifty to sixty meetings uh, per week consistently you know, without, uh, without, without fail. Um, I'm looking after quite a lot of countries and um, I'm looking after quite a lot of businesses, you know, so it's quite complex because all the countries that I look after are outside of uh, South Africa. So within a country, a country might have three businesses that I'm dealing with. So when you look at a count, you know, I'm dealing with, uh, you know, somewhere close to about 100, you know, businesses, you know, uh, in my 
a cycle of working. This is internal because our organization is very huge. And then I'm also dealing with um, a lot of multinational, you know, organizations uh, dealing with people all over all over the world. So we cannot meet physically, and our only way of interacting is through is through uh, you know Teams and Zoom. You know, so what we have found there is that um, the tools, number one, as much as, you know, people might feel that, you know, the pandemic has been bad in that respect. When I look at it from an efficiency perspective, uh, efficiency in terms of delivery, efficiency in terms of costs, efficiency in terms of value creation, I find it more efficient because I could be in a meeting in Morocco at eight o'clock, at nine o'clock, I'm in a meeting in Nigeria. At um, ten o'clock, I'm in a meeting in Cote d'Ivoire. At eleven o'clock, I'm in a meeting in Botswana. At uh, twelve o'clock, I'm in a meeting in Kenya. At one o'clock, I'm in a meeting in Tanzania. At two o'clock, I'm in a meeting in Cameroon. At three o'clock, I'm talking to someone in the UK. At four o'clock, I'm in a meeting in Benin. At five o'clock, I'm in a meeting in Burkina Faso. At six o'clock, I'm in a meeting in Uganda. You know, in a day, you know, I wake eight countries, you know, sometimes 10 if the meetings are 30 minutes long, depending on the duration of the meeting. So I can work 20, 10 countries in a single day, and you wouldn't do that, you know, uh, if there was no, uh, you know, the world that we are in now, you know, if we were to travel, in that one day, maybe you'd still be moving from one airport, you know, to the other. So I have found that the world we are in is efficient in terms of driving value, you know, and promoting, you know, engagement. That's one. Number two, the other thing that I have found is I do what I call learning sessions. So if I see something in Morocco that I feel other countries ought to learn, I organize what I call a learning session. And in a learning session, I can have about 60 or 80 people, you know, from, you know, let's say 30 or so countries. And if we were to calculate the cost of their travel, you know, it could be maybe 5 million rands, 10 million rands in the currents in the country where I live. But when you do that on a team's call, you know, you are optimizing, you know, so in that one hour, you've been able to get everybody, you know, communicate, engage, whatever calls we make, we make, everybody continues with their day. So it becomes efficient for everybody. And then now, if I move acro across to the question of um, digitization, um, for me, what I have seen so far is that it is, it is the, way, the way to go. And unless you actually transition into digitization, you will find yourself being uh, obsolete. So for me now, what I have seen through digitization is that if I look at the, my, my main industry, I am in insurance and the businesses I'm uh, dealing with are uh, life insurance, uh, general insurance, health insurance, you know, and asset management. So what we are seeing out there is that unless you digitize your businesses, you're going to find yourself, uh, you know, irrelevant. And when I look at my world of innovation, all the solutions that we are looking for are solutions that say, how do you transform insurance or financial services from the way it has been done for the last centuries, you know, into digital enablement. And some of the things we will be launching in the market, you know, you know, in the in the in the next few months to come, you know, will show you know the world how you can actually transform an organization because we have now far found those opportunities to actually operate in a totally, totally different way. And then secondly, we are now in the fourth industrial uh, revolution. So when you really look at the fourth industrial revolution, it is underpinned by you know, core technological advancements such as machine learning, such as artificial intelligence, such as the internet of things, such as blockchain, such as digital currencies and all of that. So the more you get closer into that world, the more you actually realize that unless you transform to digitization, you will not be able you know, to operate. So for in our world, it is actually transforming our external environment and businesses have no choices 
but to actually adapt and then we as individual you know also you have to you know adapt to also become digitized thank you felix thank you so much yes yeah there's a real almost change management program that one is to to run on digital especially if you are around my age and the problem is it keeps on keeps on changing i i see i'm going to jump a few questions and go to i'm going to try to attempt to to combine three questions because these gentlemen are asking on the same domain they almost want to 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 to, to us to touch this very important it's about it's about family leadership the first one is brighton brighton says difficult as it is for you to be a single parent you seem to be doing well well done how do you ensure that the boys have the best of parenthood what are some of the things you do with your boys quality time and prepare them to prepare them for the future so Brighton is talking about the boys and then brother sam says leadership in the home how can men become better leaders in the home and what good habits should we develop and the bad ones that we should stop and then finally, Brother Taff says, are you able to share examples of where you have seen transformational leadership at work in the family? So let me hand them over to you. Feel free oh, if you want to. Oh, Christian Men's Network. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Okay, let's, let, let's go for it. So leading, I'm going to start off uh, leading uh, a family of boys so i've got three sons <laughs> so i've been raising them now on my own for uh, it's four years uh, next month so um, it has been quite an experience you know because when my wife went home uh to be with the lord uh you know my kids you know at different ages you know so i was quite nervous you know that sure Am I going to cope? How is it going to work? You know, will I have the strength? Um, so I used to be so, so busy, you know, with work uh, and many other things at the time, you know, so I had to transition, you know, to make my children, you know, a, a priority, you know, in the context of being uh, one parent. There are some personal decisions that I made, you know, that I had to live to. So those meant that, um, you know, I had to take a very, a very, very tough path, you know, to, you know, to pursue. So as I've been raising my children over the last, um, you know, nearly four years now, what I've been, you know, seeing, you know, as areas of challenges and uh, growth and development for me personally, you have been around how do you continue to sustain them spiritually? How do you continue to sustain them physically? You know, how do you continue to make sure that you bring them as well balanced, you know, our children? So the ideal, you know, is, you know, for children to grow up, you know, when their mother, you know, is there, you know, because as men, there are things that we can impart to them, but there are things that we can't. You know, as much as, you know, you can be a loving dad, you can try your best, but there is there are things that only women, you know, are equipped and empowered by God, you know, to supply and to support them with. So I could never, you know, replace uh, Cleopatra. You know, I would never replace it because I'm just Michael and I'm just a man. I'm not uh, a woman. So as I've been raising the boys um, from where I am as a father, I've been doing my best to do uh, what you can do, but there are moments where you realize, sure, oh, they are really, really needing their mother here, and I'm not their mother, you know, so I can try to compensate, but sometimes they are, you know, they are very open that, ah, dad, you know, mom would do better than you in this one, you know, so it doesn't go well, you know, all the time. So all you do then is, you know, to just keep finding strength, you know, from the Lord. So let's say Cleo would give 100% and I would give 100 they are getting 200% as being 100%. In my own instance, I'm only giving one portion of the 100%. So in that instance, you know, you then, you know, try to give what, what you would call, this is the best I can in the circumstances. And for me now, because I've got quite a hectic, um, you know, set of things that I do, you know, I'm also an author, you know, I'm busy writing my 75th book you know, at the minute. So that also takes time. I run my own ministry, you know, as well. That takes a lot of time. So creating a balance, you know, is not easy, but, you know, God just gives you the strength in that way. So there are ups, there are downs, there are successes, there are failures. And then now, when it comes to uh, transformational leadership, 
transformational leadership is a very interesting one. So the onus of transformational leaders is on people like all of us, you know, on this, uh, on this call today. Transformational leadership is, is often easier to talk about, you know, when others are leading <laughs> and they are not leading. So it's often easier to say, ah, those leaders should adopt transformational leadership. But what, what I have found to be a challenge is when you get put, you know, in the role of being, um, you know, a leader, do you apply transformational leadership? You know, so what is transformational leadership? So if you look at it from the outside in, you know, one of the areas you need to look at is the environment, right? As a leader, what are you doing towards the environment? Can you mobilize your shareholders, your principals to commit some resources to the environment? One, two, the society, the community. Once you are in that leadership role, it's often to say, ah, they should do more about the community, about this. When you are in that leadership role, can you divert some resources to the community? That's a transformation. And then thirdly, I've seen uh, an area of uh, gender imbalance, you know, in the workplace. So in the workplace, uh, you know, ladies are not given, you know, a lot of opportunity. So when you get into those leadership uh, roles, are you willing, you know, to empower ladies? Are you willing to empower, you know, them to get opportunity? That's an area of transformation. And then transformation around, you know, organizational change. Once you are in that role, are you thinking of the transformation you can make internally, you know, for the betterment of the organization and creating the value that lies, you know, that is attached to your mandate? So often that word transformational leadership, it's an easy buzzword to punt. But once you are in those shoes, I mean, like, it's normally something that, you know, you can easily, you know, turn aside and, you know, and not do. So the onus is on us to say when we are put in those leadership positions, when you look back, you can say, I've been a transformational leader. And then the third question that was asked around, um, you know, leadership in the home and in the family. So my personal view, um, I'm not sure if, it's, if it is founded by research or not, but my personal view is the first and foremost primary place, you know, to end of leadership is leadership in the home. And the leadership in the external environment is directly proportional and aligned to your leadership in the home, to your leadership in the family. There is no way, <laughs> you know, that you can be a good leader out there when you are not a good leader, you know, in the home. And that leadership in the home is a very interesting one, Brother Sam. You know, if we come back to, you know, the domain of, um, the domain of purpose, when you look at uh, the leadership in the home, you need to work it uh, in, in this framework. And this is not a definitive framework, but I would outline it as a guide, you know, to those that may want to, you know, get some insight as to, you know, how do you, how do you navigate on this one? Number one, from a leadership in the home perspective, you need to locate the purpose of your family. So there is the location of purpose at an individual level, every single person, he has got a purpose from the Lord and you may be wife and husband, but you have been given different purposes from the Lord and your children may have different purposes. So one, you need to locate the purpose uh, of your family. And then number two, in the leadership of the family, you have to locate the vision for the family. Because what you often find is people are running families, but there is no vision on the family. You've got a vision for the corporate organization, but actually your family is no vision. So number two, do you have a vision for your family? And then number three, do you have a mission for your family? So you can read and recite the corporate <laughs> mission statement, but does your family has any mission, you know, statement? Do you have a mission for your family? And then number four, do you have objectives, you know, for your family? You know, so as an example, like um, what I do with my family, even when my wife is gone, you know, every year with my children in December, you know, we take time, you know, to draft our family vision, our family goals, you know, for the year. And we document it into a document. So I've got my own, you know, uh, a vision that's documented. Each of my children has got their own vision that's documented. All of us have got our own objectives. And we combine that into one document. So before Christmas each year, we, every person in my family, we sign, you know, a document, you know, that has got each person's goals, 
each person's vision, you know, in there. And then once we sign it, we then lift it up to the Lord. And then every month we track it just as I track the corporate. We track our monthly vision. I sit around with my, my boys. We walk through once a month. How are we doing on our vision? What's working? What's not working? What have we achieved? So you need those objectives. And then after those objectives, you need a strategy for the family. What is your strategy to pursue? You know, the vision you have on the family. And then after that strategy, you then need the execution. It's one thing to have the vision, but are you executing? And then once you, once you have started the execution, you only need two things. One, you're measurable. How are you measuring it? And then lastly, your feedback process. How are you looping in? So that's my insight into, you know, family leadership. Thanks, Felix. Wow, that's very, that's very thorough. It's literally like a corporate uh, 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 that is running in the home. I want to double click on one question that, that Brother Sam raised there, because I think it's important for the men. He, he asked about the good habits, and I think you've, you've gone into that. And I think part of the, the vision that you've talking about, spoken about, it talks to that. But I want to, 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 to ask about, he says, are there bad habits that we should talk? Are there any habits that you think some men should talk? Do you have any bad habits that you yes. have? Yes. <laughs> so, sure, those are quite a lot. And uh, hey, thank God for growing up. <laughs> so there are lots and lots of uh, bad, uh, bad habits. Uh, simple things like, um, you know, when you take off, when you get into the house, the moment you open the door, do you take off your shoes? Because often you open the door, you don't dust off your shoes, you know, you're just walking around the house, you know, with dirty shoes, you know, uh, putting dirt all over the house. So because, uh, you know, when I've uh, domesticated myself, you know, in my season, I've gotten to learn what it means to keep a house clean. So a simple thing like, do you take off your shoes when you get in the house? Number one, when you take them off, do you put them on a shoe rack? You know, because you can take them off and you see shoes lying all over on the floor. So that's a bad habit. Two, um, you know, when you take off, um, you know, your socks, you know, do you put them in a washing basket or you just take them off and they are lying around? So that's another example. And then number three, you know, when you eat uh, food, you know, how do you prepare the table? You know, do you just cook food and then each person just puts food in their plate? and they go and sit, you know, do you set the table up? You know, how do you do the etiquette around the table? So there, there are lots of, uh, you know, bad habits. And then I would pick another one. When you finish eating, <laughs> do you take your plate to the kitchen? You know, do you put your leftovers, if they are to go in the bin or whatever? And then do you sort your plates, you know, into the sink and all of that? So there are some bad habits there. If you are reading any books, you know, after reading a book, do you put the book back in the shelf or do you leave the book, you know, just lying around? And then when you take off, um, you know, dirty clothes, you know, do you, you know, pick them nicely somewhere or do you just throw them, you know, all over? And then when it comes, you know, to diet and to eating, you know, are you eating well? Are you eating healthy? And then when it comes to, you know, physical fitness and health, are you exercising and not exercising? and then some other general etiquette. So there are a lot of things that, you know, that one can do wrong. You know, if you like watching TV, you know, a lot, you know, are you demonstrating a good example to the kids, you know, by spending a lot of time on TV and all of that. And then the last thing for me would be around balance. You know, are you balancing life properly? Because when I look at my schedule as an example, it tends to be skewed. And when I challenge myself on that, I ask, is this a good habit? Am I modeling correctly to the children? And then when I then see them mirror me in some respects on some things, I then realize that no, there are some bad habits that I have. So continually one has to work on them. Thank you, Felix. I like, I like that. So you see your child doing what you do and you really don't like it. Uh, <laughs> I, want, I want to combine two questions from brother, one question is from brother Jones and the other one is from brother Paul. Brother Jones says, <laughs> Tom Peters wrote, organizational politics is like sexy in the 1950s. No one spoke about it, but everyone knew it was happening. Have you ever had to deal with organizational conflict where tough decisions had to be made to save the organization from disintegration? And then Brother Paul, Paul Mapinkire says, leadership involves picking the right priorities and sacrificing for the greater. 
What are some of the difficult choices you have had to make as a leader? So both of them are talking about tough decisions, organization, your personal experience, and um, what, what you have uh, uh, done and learned from that. All right. Thank you, guys. Sure. Those are loaded, loaded questions which we can do uh, books on. So let me pick the first one in the order, uh, organizational conflict. So um, the issue on organizational conflict we will not go away. You know, whether you are in the 50s, we are now in the 2021s, and even if we project, um, you know, a few years or a few decades from now, the issue of organizational conflict, you know, will not go away. So what I would like to say first uh, as a pronouncement is that organizational conflict is healthy. You know, organizational conflict is healthy. You know, what's critical around organizational conflict is how do you manage you know, organizational conflict? Because you often find um, you know, people wear different heads in an organization. So on one hand, one hand you have, I'm gonna use examples of roles. You can have sales people on one end. Their job is to bring in the revenue. So they are just out there to bring in the revenue. And then on the other hand, you've got a risk, the risk and compliance people. Their job is to look at, you know, where is the risk and where is, uh, you know, the compliance. So to a salesperson, you know, you just want to bring in the money. To a risk manager, they are saying, hey, <laughs> you know, you're bringing a lot of risk to this organization. We have to mitigate the risk. If you go to the accounting guys, they are just after profit, profit, profit. So as a salesperson, you want to spend more money for growth. And then the accountant is saying, no, <laughs> you are increasing our cost base. So you are chowing, you know, off our um, profitability. So there is a conflict there on those three parties. But is it a bad conflict? No, it is a good conflict. So the issue is not about the existence of the conflict. The issue is around how do you resolve the conflict to create the right balance? And, you know, the more you, you operate in these things, you always find that there is a place of balance that exists. So often it's a lot of, uh, you know, negotiation, negotiation. So we salespeople may have wanted to be 100% aggressive, you know, when they take in the views of the accountants and the risk managers, then their level of aggression becomes maybe 80%. So it's in the creation of the balance. But conflict is good, and let's keep the conflict going because in there it helps us to shape the organization. And then when it comes to priorities, that one you're going to face it almost on a daily basis. You know, the battle against priorities or the battle, the battle of how do you prioritize is an ongoing everyday, everyday challenge. So your way to always align yourself is to focus on the mandate. Because your principal, the shareholder, or in a non-shareholder organization, you always have a mandate. So whenever you are looking at priorities, you are looking at what gives you the most optimal result and at what cost. So you look at um, how those priorities help you achieve the objective. But at the same time, you know, I don't think there's no organization with no constraint. There are always constraints. The constraint could be money, it could be the schedule, it could be prioritization, it could be time, it could be quality. There are many different constraints that you have to deal with. So when you look at um, the list of priorities and then you rank them against, um, you know, against the various constraints, in that sort of metrics, you know, that's where your prioritization calls you know, will come through. So sometimes uh, when people can't handle uh, the conflict between priorities and uh, ultimate decisions, this is where you then find either boardroom coups happening, so many other things happening, or people resigning, you know, from a place of work because, you know, their priorities were not being, you know, prioritized. So someone then feels, oh, they are not being recognized as important enough. As a result of that, they end up leaving the organization. So the battle of priorities is an everyday one. And uh, if I were to just uh, maybe share some wisdom, all I would say is, you know, apply the three rules, communicate rule number one, communicate rule number two, and communicate rule number three. 
<laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Uh, those are those are great rules that we should we should um, we should implement. I've got some two girls here who are um, nicely disturbing you, but they will not. Okay, cool. I want I want to to go to to combine two questions again. One is from Brother Essien, and another is from uh, from Fungai. Um, Emmanuel Essien says, Brother Mike, I'd like you to speak briefly about your succession plan in your current role. What would be your duty? Would, would it would that be your duty or the group? And if left for you, what core qualities would you look for in such a person or people? And how long will it take to prepare such people? You might just need uh, more than you might just need more than one uh, body to step in that big shoes of yours. <laughs> okay. And then, and then Fungai asks something similar. Fungai, brother Fungai says, please explain the role of coaching in transformal leader, transformational leadership as opposed to mentorship. So let's start off with brother, brother, um, brother, 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 Emmanuel Essien there. His question is more about your role, uh, what you're doing to, to, to prepare for your successor. All right. So same, uh, same story. I'm being fried here. <laughs> I feel like I am in a frying pan. But anyway, thank you guys. I mean, like, I, I'm excited. So let me talk about succession planning. So for me as a person, as well as uh, wearing, um, you know, in this instance, wearing a business hat, you know, one thing that we have to do from day one, you know, is to uh, develop, mentor, and groom uh, our successors. You know, so to those that are close to me, both in the organization or around me you know they know that i always work with uh, a succession plan so in my current role i'm mean, like i've got two uh, support people two innovation and growth uh, managers you know that i'm grooming you know so what i've done in this instance is to split my portfolio into two one looks after the other half the other looks after the other half but we cross pollinate across the entire portfolio so how i groom my team for succession succession is that in every engagement that we have, I don't do meetings alone. You know, I all, I'm always with my team, you know, in meetings. So I don't run like a one-man shop. So every single meeting that I do, I'm always with my team. And then what we then do now, just as a model, is that I equip my teams before our meetings, you know, so they go to meetings prepared. And then I give them tasks, you know, during meetings as part of our uh, the grooming the grooming process and then um, most of the time you know i don't actually present you know i equip my teams to present and then my teams then present and then i comment you know as necessary you know in the sessions and then the other thing that um you know i do i don't know i mean like you know if any of you guys would find this useful um you know for every single meeting that you know we do you know we write uh, documented minutes and uh, we issue those minutes within 10 minutes, maximum 15 minutes of the meeting happening. So I've trained my team now, you know, to be able to, you know, document uh, outcomes of a meeting. And uh, as part of that process, you know, we have been around our organization for eight months. We have run in excess of 1,500 meetings now in the period, and each of those meetings are sufficiently documented. So if anything, you know, I would leave the organization or whatever i've got people that will just run and it's seamless and then within the countries that um, i'm looking after we have um you know engaged with the local ceos to appoint dedicated people that look after innovation and uh, and growth and in a few countries now we now have uh, you know new people that have been hired you know to you know to occupy this function and then what i have done is to set up what i call innovation and growth committees which are chaired by the country CEO and myself and my team, we participate in them on a monthly basis. So each country is now taken ownership. And then within that, we have come up with uh, programs, innovation programs per country. So for each of our countries, we range from 10 to 20 different programs. So each country now is with its own programs. They are you know, running independently. And then from where we sit, we then just play an oversight role. So succession, succession planning, you know, just happens seamlessly. And then when you look at uh, coaching and mentorship, for me, I believe that is something that 
we really, really need to do. And I like uh, what Herman was saying when he was introducing the session, you know, just saying that one of the goals and the objectives of our Christian men's ministry, you know, is to develop mentors and coaches. So we need uh, coaches and, and mentors. So the difference between a coach and a mentor, you know, in a transformational leadership setup is a very, is a very interesting one. So, you know, when you look at, um, you know, mentorship, you know, you're trying to groom someone, you know, you're trying to show them the trade, you know, you're trying to equip them, you know, with the skills, you know, to be able to stand on their own. You know, you are not there to be imposing, you know, to them, right? But you're just equipping and equipping and equipping. And then when you are a coach now, you are more like a guide. You are more like a guide. You are more like a guide. So what we need to do is from a coach and a mentor perspective, we need to challenge ourselves when we are occupying those roles. Are we true to being coaches or we end up now wanting to impose ourselves on our mentees or the people that we are coaching? So often we as mentors and coaches, we have got quite a big role to play, but we need to ensure that we are now not constraining you know, the people that we are coaching and mentoring, we give them sufficient liberty. And also to separate that, whoever you are mentoring, you don't own them. You know, whoever you are coaching, you don't own them. Some, you know, a lot of the people that we coach and mentor, they will grow and they will outgrow us, you know, and they wanna be independent. And, you know, we, we must also be prepared to be coached and mentored by them, you know, so it's an evolving model you know, that we ought to apply. So in an organizational setup, every person should have a coach. It does not matter your level. Even if you are CEO, it does not matter. You must have a coach. You know, you must also have a mentor. That's my view. Okay, great. Uh, that's, uh, that's, 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 that's an important point. You say, you say everyone should have a coach. Yes. Everyone should have, should have a coach. Run that again. What's the difference between the coach and the mentor? <laughs> right. So it's 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 quite um it's quite a fine line. So a coach is more I'm like I use the word guide because that's when I, I'm able to separate you know what is a mentor, what is a coach. So for me, I look at a coach as more like a guide. You know, so when I look at a mentor and a coach, I look at a mentor as being much closer to my process than my coach. So my coach is more like guiding and shaping, but my mentor is in the equipping. My mentor is in the equipping. My mentor is in the intimacy. My mentor is in the detail. So it's, it's quite a fine line, you know, between the two. And for the most part, you might actually find that maybe we're using the two words, you know, interchangeably, but they are actually separate, separate roles uh, to them. Thank you, thank you. It, it, I, and I think it emphasised the fact that we need, we need, we need someone. We need more than someone to be to be around us, to be to be to be to be helping us. I want to see. We, we are we are drawing to the close here. I want to, to squeeze um, about three questions. So let's try to go through them fairly quickly. The first one, Brother Blessing says, Mike, how can one expedite a culture of innovation and disruptive thinking in an environment with systems and people stuck in the past? We have always done it this way. Is it worth investing one's time and effort in that kind of setup? Over to you. All right. So, uh, blessing. That's a very, very important uh, question, and it's linked to the question that was asked earlier around, you know, the organizational conflict of, uh, you know, the nineteen fifties. So, one of the challenges we face in organizations is the ability uh, for people to move quickly. In the innovation world, we call it agility. So from an innovation perspective, uh, you know, we apply different tools and methodologies like design thinking. We apply uh, implementation tools like agile uh, thinking, agile execution. So theoretically, those things are sound, but organizations tend to be very solid. So if you want to find a quick path to execution, whatever innovation program you are running must have a sponsor that is seated and situated in the right places. So you can't innovate uh, without someone up in the hierarchy being a sponsor of that innovation. You are more likely to fail and it's more likely to take you longer. 
So an innovation program has to be sponsored uh, by somebody, you know, sitting at a group expo level, and then that cascading down, you know, has to come through at all levels. And then once you get the structure right, you then need to support it with a change management program. So if you do not have a change management program, you're more likely to never to never succeed. And then when you have a change management program, the currency to change is time. So you must always remember that it takes a much longer process to get people on board, but eventually you will, right? So you then just need to design an appropriate change management program. And then where you see the organization changing too slowly to your liking, do not quickly give up or do not quickly say it's never gonna work. You know, just continue. Remember the three rules, communication, communication, communication. And if ever you try it to a point where you say it's never gonna work, then that becomes a very different issue. But there are different supporting processes and tools that we can apply to get the process being smoother. Even as we do it, you know, in our context way, it's, it's quite complex. It's not easy, but day in, day out, you're continually working at the process. This one is a big one from Fungai. I think Fungai is being naughty, but he says, how much have you digitized in your home? <laughs> so, 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 you know, I, I didn't know God has got a sense of humor. <laughs> you know, I used to look at him as big God, big scary God. You know, so when he asked me to do innovation, <laughs> I wasn't even digitized, you know, at a personal level. I don't even have, uh, you know, the phones that, you know, most of you actually have. If you look at my phone, you're like, oh, wow, <laughs> this dude, you know, uh, my car that I have, um, you know, I bought it in 2001. Um, it's a 1999 uh, model, you know, Ford Focus. So that's how backward I am, you know, as a person. Yet with the humor of God, I'm asked to lead uh, innovation. So my home is not, uh, you know, digitized, you know, so I'm a laggard. You know, yet my children are way ahead of me in terms of their innovation. So it's quite funny now when you take a character like mine and then you put it in an innovative, <laughs> you know, seat and I have to do all these innovation programs, yet at a personal level, I'm a laggard. You know, it's the humor of God. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks, Mike. Uh, um, I, I, I've just told that you guy that I, I think this one is a tough one. Right, let's, let's close on with this one, probably two minutes or so. Brother Sam says, we've had rights in South Africa this past week. What are the leadership lessons for you on how this has been handled? What are the leadership lessons in, in general for Africa compared to the first world to achieve its... What are the leadership lessons in general for Africa compared to the first world to achieve its full potential? All right. Yeah, thank, thank you for that, Brother Sam. Uh, what I would say for me uh, have been lessons, uh, number one, at an economic, socioeconomic level, um you know we do have you know quite huge inequality you know uh in our country and across uh, many of the developing countries so when you have um you know such inequality in nations ultimately the bebo uh you know is gonna best so there is a lesson there around how do we manage economies where there is a huge disparity you know in um you know in um in, in wealth uh, balance, that's number one. Number two for me has been that uh, if you really look at the effects of uh, the lockdown, you know, it's it's easier to, to try and minimize it. But the more you lock down a person, the more you begin to steer some hostility, you know, in a person because naturally, you know, we are not meant to be locked down, you know, so, what the lockdown has done to many people, you know, it's not an area that is spoken about a lot, but it has done a lot of mental health damage, you know, to a number of people. It has done a lot of emotional damage, you know, to a lot of people. So it's a very simple trigger, you know, you will experience an explosion. So we need to really think about, you know, how better can we manage situations like pandemics, you know, in a manner that still allows some degree of movement because the more you contain people in a cage you know a moment just comes one day when the bubble bursts and then lastly you know looking at lessons if we compare what's happening here and elsewhere in the world you know there are political lessons brother sam 
you know, around how do we lead politically, you know, in more stable ways, more sustainable ways. You know, I think as Africa, we still have uh, some lessons to learn. And then when you look at where Europe is at today, you know, and where we are at right now, you also see some differences in the execution of policy. You know, how are we implementing policy relative to others? And then lastly, you know, when you look at the overall healthcare setup, you know, you also see that we're still lagging relative to the to the other world. So there are quite a lot of lessons there, Brother Sam, that we can take home. Mike, thank you so much. Really appreciate your insight and knowledge there. And uh, thank you so much for, for waking up so early on a call, Jobek, and uh, having this very useful uh, discussion with 50 men. We are out of time. I'm going to end, over, end here to end here and hand over to Brother Yemen. Brother Yemen, over to you. Thank you, thank you, sir. I mean, that, that was just amazing. Uh, I, can, I can listen to you two for the whole day. And, and Mike, uh, you, you were amazing. Uh, I, 